If you can't ship them out, put them on a ship. With plans to send the UK's asylum seekers to Rwanda on hold, the government plans to house them on barges. It's the latest in a chain of questionable moves to control immigration and deter asylum seekers. But will it work or further aggravate a policy failure? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the UK's increasingly controversial approach to immigration. With a massive backlog of asylum applications, the British government is looking for ways to deter undocumented migrants and asylum seekers from coming to the UK. And if they can't be deterred, the UK will need to find ways to house them. A British court recently halted a government plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda while their applications are being reviewed, a process that can take months, if not years. So many of them instead wait in hundreds of hotels across the UK which the government says is too costly to be a long-term solution. So as an alternative, less expensive source of housing, the government has contracted a giant barge. It will arrive from Italy in the coming months to be moored at the Isle of Portland, just off the Dorset coast in southern England. The plan has been heavily criticized by human rights groups who say barges are a cruel place to house vulnerable people who've endured unimaginable hardships. Here's a look now at the vessel itself. The Bibi Stockholm has been used all over Europe to accommodate asylum seekers, and the 91-meter-long vessel was previously used in the Netherlands. It will house 500 single men in 220 bedrooms and has facilities including a gym, games room and bar. Provisions will be made for health care and catering, as well as security. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak who has vowed to stop the boats as one of his key voter pledges, said the barge would save taxpayers money. Um, we can't have a situation we are collectively spending £6 million a day on hotels for illegal asylum seekers. That can't be right. I said that I would do everything I could to stop that and reduce the pressure on our communities from asylum seekers being in hotels. And that's what we're doing. We're bringing forward alternative sites like indeed the barge that we've announced today that will save us money and indeed reduce pressure on hotels. All part of our plan to stop the boats. We're also putting through Parliament a new law which will ensure that if you arrive here illegally, you will not have the ability to stay. We will be able to detain you and then swiftly remove you to your own country if it's safe, or a third alternative, third country alternative like Rwanda. Currently, more than 51,000 asylum seekers are being housed in around 400 hotels across the UK. The government plans to move migrants abroad the vessel in the coming months, and it will be operational for at least 18 months. The Home Secretary, Suela Braverman, is expected to announce similar barges at a later date. The move has angered many who view it as an attempt to isolate refugees from the wider community and highlights the gross mismanagement of the UK's asylum system. So is it gross mismanagement or a novel way to approach a complex problem? Joining me now to debate that and more are from Norwich. David Campbell Bannerman, chairperson of the Freedom Association, a pressure group in the UK, and former conservative member of the European Parliament. Hopefully joining us later in the program, we'll have Amanda Jones. She is a barrister at uh, Great James Street Chambers, specializing in immigration and public law. But joining us now from Newcastle is John Howarth, director of Politics Without Borders and former Labour member of the European Parliament. Thanks so much for being with us. John Howarth, uh, let's start with this barge. Could it be described as a creative, thinking outside the box solution to deal with you know, an unavoidable backlog of asylum applicants? Well, as far as I can see, it's a very large box on the water uh, designed to essentially imprison people. But whether or not it's going to contribute to a solution. It, it, it's not the basis of the problem. The basis of the problem is that we have an asylum system in the UK which is dysfunctional, uh, which has failed to deal with asylum claims, which has created a huge backlog, uh, and which has been entirely mismanaged by the Home Office. That's the first point. The second point is when we left the European Union, despite the UK government having been warned 
repeatedly uh, about the problem, uh, we managed to leave the European Union without an agreement in place with the uh, residual European Union, the EU27, uh, uh, on returns um, of people who uh, cross for asylum but have previously been in a safe country. Mm. Uh, that was something we had under the European Union, and we failed, despite warning, uh, to negotiate on that. And thirdly, uh, the lack of uh, legal channels um, for migration um, makes the illegal uh, immigration and asylum problem worse. And until we did address those long-term, serious issues, uh, issues like whether we put people on barges or in hotels uh, are simply dealing with the symptoms and not dealing with the cause. Uh, and this is a serious problem. We need to deal with the cause. Okay. I mean, do you think the cause can be addressed? Or, I mean, in some cases, it actually almost sounds broken beyond repair. But, I mean, how confident are you that there are solutions out there to make the UK asylum system work? I'm not very confident mm. at all because it's a very, very serious problem. And I think that when politicians dismiss serious problems with glib slogans like stop the boats or, I don't know, put them on a barge or whatever, um, it fails to deal with the, the, the real issue that we have. Um, I mean, the European Union has uh, contributed uh, a lot of money to running a, um, refugee facilities in Turkey, around right? about $2 billion um, a year, and, and that, is, uh, that is something that's helped to contain some of the problem. But these are long-term difficulties uh, that we will not resolve, uh, any one res country will re not resolve on their own, the things that we've got to seek to resolve uh, through proper international agreements. And when wars break out and famine breaks out and all of those other issues that cannot be addressed by a single country uh, create international problems, then we do have serious issues. But we could seek to address the problem by creating proper legal mechanisms and negotiating a proper returns agreement with the European Union okay. and fixing our own asylum system. Mm. I would like to listen quickly to what the Interior Minister actually said uh, last month about the strategy now uh, focusing on deterring asylum seekers in the first place via the larger illegal immigration bill that was passed last month. Let's listen quickly to Suella Braverman. They will not stop coming here until the world knows that if you enter Britain illegally, you will be detained and swiftly removed. Yeah. Removed back to your country if it's safe or to a safe country, a safe third country like Rwanda. And that is precisely what this bill will do. That is how we will stop the boats. Uh, David, I can see you nodding your head in agreement with Suella Braverman there, but uh, critics say, you know, it's, it's policy like that that has actually exacerbated the problem by refusing to meet human rights obligations and instead insisting on these deterrents that are legally questionable at best. No, I mean, the, the, the Home Office, which Suella Braverman uh, leads, has got some very expensive lawyers that advise her on this. Look, it's what the Australians did very successfully. They said to asylum seekers or uh, whatever you call them, um, coming to Australia, that if you land in Australia, you will have no uh, right to, to settle in Australia. And it went from about 60,000 a year, uh, the boats coming uh, right away from Indonesia, et cetera, to, to zero. Um, and it's a similar policy. You have to provide, I'm afraid, some disincentives for this very dangerous traffic and for some very nasty people in, in these tra uh, tra traffickers making large amounts of money out of it. Okay, Amanda is actually with us now. Let me turn to you then, Amanda, because David seems to think the system is actually on track. So why do so many feel that this massive backlog and all the other problems and the criticism, especially from human rights organizations that these policies have encountered, why do they believe the system is broken? Well, ever since I've been doing immigration law, which was from 2002, the Home Office has always uh, been useless at making decisions quickly, accurately, 
and fairly. Uh, that goes both ways. They sometimes uh, granted huge numbers of, of applications without considering them properly. And they're now faced with, for example, thousands of Albanians who they accepted without any proof or Kosovans. Mm. Um, but the backlog has got significantly worse over the last couple of years um, for no apparently good reason of 48 odd thousand people who claimed asylum last year very few have actually had a decision the best way of dealing fairly with um, migrants fairly both to them and to the uk is to process claims quickly fairly and properly and provide a right of appeal which doesn't take years to exercise um, if that were done a lot of the problems would disappear however uh, you, you know amanda well, let me just ask you quickly because you brought up albania uh, and i know david has made comments on that before uh, it, something like a third of the applicants by some estimates are actually from albania why are they getting what might seem to be preferential treatment? Their asylum claims are being accepted and they're being allowed when they don't have necessarily a legitimate case to say that they don't have a safe country to return to and that they will suffer or be persecuted if they go home. Most Albanian claims um, don't succeed. Mm. Those from Albanian men are certified as clearly unfounded with no right of appeal. Albanian women's cases are different. They do generate a right of appeal because many of them have been victims of sex trafficking. Uh, but very few Albanian men's cases are accepted. Okay, interesting. Uh, David, let me ask you then, um, so now that it's been clarified that they're actually not accepted, then why is the, the, uh, the system taking so long to just send back the ones that clearly aren't entitled to asylum? Why are they left to languish? I mean, why is this, this sitting in the system creating this massive backlog? Well, Aisha, I do agree with Amanda that the, there is a problem with the system mm -hmm. and the Home Office. It, it is struggling with the numbers. It's, it seems to be incredibly inefficient at, at, at what it's doing, and, and uh, it should hurry up. You know, it should be able to do this a lot faster than it is. Um, on Albania, I mean, the whole point there is it's a safe country. You know, no one, fortunately, is, is you know, there's no uh, sort of risk to life there as such. Um, uh, which obviously you have in Iran or Iraq, for example, potentially. Um, so it, it really should be a very clear case. And there is a, a returns policy now or an agreement with Albania which speeds it all up. I mean, part of the blockage is you need to agree with countries to return their citizens to them. And then you have the additional uh, problem where people destroy their documentation and they claim to be from a, a country which does have legitimate uh, problems and threat to life. And so they, they're playing the system in, in many ways. Um, but I think the overall problem is is, you know, there's this whole knot of human rights laws, like the ECHR, the European uh, Convention on Human Rights and the Court on Human Rights, um, the Refugee Convention, et cetera, which hasn't kept up with modern day needs. You know, people are coming huge distances. We've got the issue of Libyan uh, refugees at the moment. Um, and th there is also a threat, by the way, of terrorists. We had this morning, uh, 19 terrorists have been found amongst the boat people coming into Britain. So I'm very concerned at this, that the system is breaking down. Mm. There's a serious problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, let, let me ask John, uh, you know, something David was alluding to there. You know, when locals, locals complain uh, in particular that, you know, people are coming in and they're not doing any background checks on, on some of them because they can't in some cases. They, they say they don't have their documents anymore and it's just impossible to get records uh, from countries that might be at war or have you know, dictatorships uh, in power like Afghanistan, for example, or uh, Syria. Uh, so they don't know if these people have criminal histories or not, and they don't want anyone allowed in until they know their background. I mean, is it fair for them to say, stop until we know who they are? Well, it is entirely fair to try to investigate where people are from and to establish whether they're legitimate uh, claimants for asylum, and that's what the system has to do. 
But that's not true in every case. And there are many cases where the system simply fails to deal with people who are making uh, a legitimate application. And, uh, you know, it, this has been the case for many, many years. But like I said earlier, it's easier to return people when you have a return agreement in place. And, uh, you know, these were part of uh, the negotiations uh, with the European Union when the UK left. Uh, and there are multiple instances of, uh, of uh, ministers reporting that to the House of Commons, that this was a matter that would be addressed in the negotiations uh, and so on. In fact, there are instances of ministers reporting to the House of Lords, one particular minister, Baroness Williams of Trafford, reporting to the House of Lords that the government had not assessed what would happen uh, were they to uh, end up in a situation where they didn't have a returns agreement. So the homework was not done. The system is not working, uh, and uh, we've seen some fairly inappropriate uh, uh, arrangements um, that have placed people um, in vulnerable positions mm. um, in the UK. And also, we have an assertion, an interesting assertion by um, Ms Braverman in the House of Commons, uh, that, uh, that people would be removed to third countries, safe countries rather, like Rwanda. Now... The UK does not have, the UK Foreign Office does not have Rwanda on its list of safe countries, and the UK has accepted asylum applications from Rwanda. So what are we meant to believe here? I mean, it, 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 and it's also a phenomenally expensive uh, way of actually dealing with this problem, a great deal more expensive, mm. I would suggest, than fixing the system or putting proper agreements in place. Right. Uh, David, I, I know you disagreed, um, but I, uh, John, just quickly on, on another angle here, there's also, you know, the question many are asking about because of the issues that Brexit uh, posed with getting the necessary immigration for certain jobs to be filled. Um, mm -hmm. Are those, you know, waiting for their asylum applications to be approved, actually maybe a resource being wasted, you know, since there's arguably a need for low-skilled workers on, on farm. Or, uh, Amanda, if you'd like to address that, go ahead. I'd be very wary of, of using asylum seekers as, as a cheap source of labour. They're either asylum seekers who we owe a duty to, uh, in which case that needs to be assessed, or they're not entitled to be here, in which case their cases should be processed and sorted out. But using them as a sort of pool of cheap labor are benefits. Well, I mean, I can imagine, though, if, and as well, I've heard certain asylum seekers complain, that they're just left to languish in hotels and in, in, in many time, in many cases in communities that they don't feel welcome or accepted in and that they would rather be working, but they're not even offered that opportunity. Sorry, John, go well, ahead. I think, I think that's a legitimate point that's made, but also I think that it's fair to say that what we have is not delivering and, and therefore it would perhaps be best uh, uh, to look at alternative uh, alternative means. But again, you know, in the absence of legitimate um, channels uh, for making applications uh, or migrating to the UK, it's not perhaps surprising that people end up in desperate situations uh, and attempt to come by other can, means. Now, I'm not I, suggesting um, that they should, I, but no, let, hang on, uh, David, perhaps if I could just, just finish on that. Um, there, there need to be um, legitimate channels uh, for people seeking to do that. One of the reasons why criminal uh, pe uh, criminals or people seeking to exploit or hide away in the economy come to the UK in the first place, why the UK is an attractive location is because we do not have a sensible identity card system that enables us to track people mm. once they're here. And that allows people to disappear uh, into the shadow economy. And that is one of the reasons yeah, it's um, attractive. I, now, I'm, sorry, I'm John, not you, guilty you, on that. I was in favour of John, that. You've, that done, in the, you've done very well on time, But look, how many people are you going to let in? I mean, you, 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 your organisation is without borders. I mean, does this mean you let everyone in? I mean, we've got very generous legal routes for Afghanis who've escaped Afghanistan under terrible circumstances, Ukrainians, Hong Kong. You know, we are doing pretty well. I'd like to see the Middle East do more, to be honest. I think Turkey is very generous. But a lot of the other Middle East countries, UAE, uh, et cetera, uh, Saudi Arabia, 
uh, you know, maybe they could do more to take in some of the numbers here. And by the way, these boats are good enough for engineers and divers and oil workers. You know, they're not prisons. And in fact, in Scotland, they're using cruise ships and the Ukrainians using those uh, MV Victoria in Scotland are very happy with the accommodation. So it's, it's, it's exaggerating the point, I think, to call them prisons. They're not prisons. Well, a prison is somewhere that you can't come and go freely from. Now, it all depends what the what the what those circumstances are. We've got all sorts of means of tracking people. If we need to track people, people can be tagged and so on, and they can be given a little, perhaps, more latitude as long as we know where they are. Mm. But of course, there is no requirement to carry documents. Now, it's it, it is it is a simple fact that the UK has taken fewer asylum uh, uh, seekers and, and refugees than most of the European countries. That's a no, simple fact. And, well, it no. was true, David. Fewer than Italy, fewer than no. Germany, fewer than France. Depends uh, how you and, measure and the facts are, Well, you, measure you know, the Office of National Statistics are the figures mm. I'm quoting. So if your association has better ones, I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to listen to them. But well, they, how, are the how official, are you they are the official um, UK how are you government figures. Asylum seekers, how are you defining refugees? How are you defining economic migrants? I mean, there is a real problem of definition in a lot of this, which it does lie, uh, you know, below the, a lot of the problems that we're all experiencing is a problem of definition. Many of these economic migrants who are not uh, uh, proper refugees in the sense their lives are not at risk, but they want a better life. Well, you can understand right. that. Uh, and again, I mean, well, David, that's why there was the argument the that the system is broken. <laughs> then get through those applications, send back the people that have safe countries to return to. But instead, it seems everyone's just languishing because this backlog is now at what a, between 130 and 100, 160,000 yeah, people. It is great. It is great. Well, well, it needs to be got through more quickly, more efficiently. Uh, David, let me ask I mean, you this though, because I, I was actually, unfortunately, we've yeah, lost a man. I would just open the doors as they did before millions coming in. Mm. in uh, the I'm not sure the doors were ever open like that. But um, I was no, going no. to ask, you know, when, when the UK government, and, and like yourself, David, says, just apply first through legal channels. What's the problem? But if you have, for example, a, a Christian in Iran or a gay man or woman in Uganda, how are they supposed to follow those proper channels when they legitimately fear... You know, they are being watched. They can't just walk into an embassy without questions. And then in Uganda now, the, the penalty is life in prison. They need to just escape in many cases. So what, what really is? There are no safe legal channels for people that are facing torture or persecution within an immediate period if they're found out. Well, I, I'm afraid, you know, we're not a, we're, we're quite a small country. We're an island. Um, we, we already have 67 million people here. Um, but we you have take a fewer space. refugees than the re other European counterparts. Well, I, I don't accept a lot of that. It depends how you define it. But but you, we've got a real struggle actually finding accommodation. We've we've increased by 7 million since 2004. We're heading to be larger than Germany in 20 years' time. Um, so, you know, there is a, a problem of space. This is why we're having to use boats, um, for example, and, and military accommodations being looked at as well. Um, you know, we don't have the housing available. Germany actually has populations declining, um, and so it's more amenable to uh, refugees or, or to, to migrants okay. coming in. Uh, 45 uh, seconds, I John. I can give you quick, quick final words. Are we really seriously saying that we're going to increase our population by more than 27 million in the next 20 years and overtake Germany? I think not. I was an economic migrant once. Uh, I couldn't get a job in the north of England, and I moved 300 miles to the south to find one. And I don't mind people doing that. Nobody's talking about open borders. Nobody's talking about that. But I think it was a massive mistake uh, to move away from the freedom of movement we had in the European Union. Uh, because the fact of the matter that people will not admit and will not be honest about is the UK's economy has relied on migration for the last 70 years. Uh, and it still does. And we create a position where we had some of the best minds um, because of that. I don't think there's okay. anything wrong with people seeking a better life. 
But the fact is, John, the system is broken. That will have to be the final word, because very unfortunately, we're out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank my panelists so much for being with us, and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter, and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.